Welcome to our home. Again, thank you for attending. Uh, this week on My Thoughts, uh, I'd like to continue our virtual tour of the Mishkan uh, with the menorah, the golden candelabra. The menorah stood on the south side of the Mishkan. The south always alludes to spirituality. You know, the Torah points out that Abravinu, Abraham our father, was always traveling towards the south. The Akedus Yitzhak stated that just as the name of the whole candelabra suggests enlightenment, its parts meaning the stems, arms, cups, and flowers, all suggest their respective functions. The stem is used to acquire wisdom, the cups to be a receptacle of such wisdom, and the flowers suggest an additional wisdom sprouting forward once the fundamentals have been absorbed properly. The height of the menorah was 18 tefachin, which represents the height of the average man. The number 18 is also an allusion to the Hebrew word chai, again, which means life. Man's intellect is divided into two categories, each which is subdivided into three parts. There is the practical as well as the speculative reasoning. Now, the practical reason deals with the first instance with man's personal concerns, second, with the concerns of his household, and third, with matters affecting the society in which he lives. Similarly, with speculative reasoning, first, man identifies his own feelings and senses. Second, he learns to determine the validity of these sensations, whether the information they convey to him is true or not. Can one trust their own senses? And third, man acquires the ability to understand the inner personal relationship between all of these phenomena. Now, the third stage is generally known as what we call bina, insight. The arms on the right side of the menorah represent three kinds of speculative reason whereas the three arms on the left side represent the three levels of practical reason. The knobs on the stems are to be seen as, so to speak, way stations, since attainment of insights are achieved only gradually, step by step. These knobs represent these steps in man's intellectual progress. You know, the Medrash explains that God did not need light. He didn't need the light of the menorah. He wanted us to provide the light for the Mishkan for him, so that he could return the favor, so to speak, provide a great light for us in the world of the future. God also wishes to demonstrate to all of mankind at large that those who kindle lights for him in this world deserve to have him light the way for them on their journey in both this world and in the next. The center shaft alludes to the written Torah and the six branches allude to the six orders of the oral Torah. The six branches illuminate the center shaft and thereby elucidate and explain for us the laws found in the written Torah. The al Sheikh states that everything in this world has its origin in the world above. So lighting the menorah in the Mishkan in this world affected the menorah that is mul, parallel to it in the celestial world. The Vilna Gaon, the Gra, stated that the menorah alludes to Torah. Psalm 119, verse 130 states, Pesach devarecha yo'ir, your opening words illuminate, which corresponds to the menorah. He says that the first verse in the first book of the Torah in Genesis, in the book of Bereshit, has seven words, which alludes to the seven arms of the menorah. The first verse in the second book of the Torah in Shemot, in Exodus, has 11 words, alluding to the 11 knobs that were on the menorah. The first verse in the third book of the Torah, Vayikra, Leviticus, has nine words, alluding to the nine flowers of the menorah. And the first verse in the fourth book of the, of the Torah, by Midbar, has 18 words, which alludes to the height of the average man, again, in numbers. And the first verse in the fifth book of the Torah, in Devarim, in Deuteronomy, has 22 words, alluding to the 22 cups of the menorah. Now, the number 22 may be an allusion to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Without these letters, it would be improbable, if not impossible, to acquire any true and long-lasting knowledge in Torah. This is also connected to the 22 cups in the design of the menorah. You know, a cup's function 
is to retain a liquid. Many times we find that our sages use water as an allusion to Torah. So the cuss may be viewed basically as a message for us to be able to retain the knowledge that we receive from the menorah, spirituality. We need a receptacle. They are the 22 cups of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, together, the numbers of the menorah equal 67. If you were to add up to 7, 11, again, 9, 22, all of them, they equal 67. The first of the 13 requests that we recite daily during our weekday Amida, the standing prayer, is Atta Chonen L'Adam Dat. It is you who bestows knowledge upon man. This prayer contains 67 letters. It is a testimony and a request that God Almighty, who is the ultimate source of all knowledge, should inspire us with the knowledge that originates from the menorah, the symbol of spirituality. The only true knowledge that exists in the world comes from knowing and believing in God Almighty and His wisdom. You know, if you were to add God, the Aleph, one, one to the number 67, then the gematria would then be 68, the numerical value of the Hebrew word, Chaim, life. All the knowledge in the world originates from God Almighty, who is the source of all wisdom and happiness in our lives. The Tanchuma states stated that the building of the Mishkan actually followed the creation of the world. The first item constructed for the Mishkan was the Ark. This correlates with the Torah which preceded the creation of the world by some 2,000 generations. Then came the Shulchan, the table which housed the showbreads, which corresponds to the vegetation that was created on the third day of creation. And next came the menorah, which corresponds to the luminaries, which were created on the fourth day of creation. The Hassam Sofer stated that the building of the Mishkan began with the holiest of the vessels, the ark, and diminished in holiness down to the outside walls. So to the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, was in a constant state of what we call tzimtzum, meaning contraction, beginning with the world of Atzilus, emanation, the highest of the four worlds, until it was able to dwell in this physical world of Asiya, the final world of creation, the lowest of all the four worlds. The Itiri Torah stated that the menorah symbolizes spirituality, which must be rooted in the source of emet, of truth. Everything must flow from it, not a compilation of parts that are stuck together, which would make it invalid. The verse also states that the menorah must be miksha, meaning beaten, beaten out of one solid block of gold. Now, this is an illusion that the only way that one can acquire Torah knowledge is through difficulty and hard work. The Sfat Emes states, based on the Talmud and the Megillah, Yogati umotsasi, I labored and then I found, alluding to Torah and Emet, truth. However, these two terms are really not compatible. You know, if one finds something, well, that is an accident. And if one toils, then one does not find he acquires. So our sages are telling us that it is impossible for a person to understand emet, truth, even with work. However, through hard work, then God Almighty gives a person a gift, much like finding buried treasure. He continues and states that this is why God Almighty showed Moshe a menorah of fire, even though it was God Almighty who made the menorah himself, not Moshe. This was an illusion that if a person wants to come closer to God Almighty, that they must first possess a true desire, meaning H, fire. Only then will God Almighty help them to achieve their true desire. The Omer Veleket states that Moshe was shown the menorah twice by God Almighty. So, so the question has to be, that being the case, why was it so difficult for him to understand? The menorah had to be made out of one solid block of gold. Well, this represented the concept, what we call achdut, unity. So on a secular level, Moshe found this difficult to comprehend. So God made it for him. Uh, this is an allusion to Mashiach. It is Mashiach who will bring true achdut, true peace, a time when the spiritual and the secular will coexist and complement each other. 
Reb Zev Salavechik also addressed this question. He said, we read that in the first temple, Shlom HaMelech, King Solomon, constructed ten menorahs, and that in the second temple, Ezra HaSofer, Ezra the scribe, constructed two menorahs. So what was there about Moshe's menorah that he found so difficult? It would seem that a special requirement for the construction of Moshe's menorah was that all of its components, the knobs, the flowers, and the cups, all had to be fashioned out of the same block of gold. In addition, the Torah states that the menorah had to be fashioned bitav nisam, meaning after their pattern. Well, this, this referred to the form that God Almighty had shown Moshe according to its dimensions. The fact that only that fact that that was only required of Moshe and his menorah. However, future generations, well, they were permitted to fashion the knobs, the flowers, and the cups as large as they wanted. This was the thing that Moshe found difficult, to be able to construct everything to the exact size and dimension that God Almighty had shown him when he was on the mountain, again, based on Ramban. The Hassam Sofer offers another opinion. He said that Moshe found it difficult to grasp that a multifaceted Torah represented by the menorah, a Torah which is replete with sophistication and many complicated disputes can emanate from only one source, from the words that God Almighty spoke at Mount Sinai. The verse ends with the words, Mimena yiyu, that it, referring to the menorah, should be made from it. The Hassam Sofer stated that all the parts that were fashioned in construction of the menorah originated from its base. This was not without symbolism. This was to tell us that all of our knowledge originates from the Torah. It is not the outside scientists or sciences or philosophies that we need in, in order to understand the Torah. It's the opposite. It is the knowledge that exists within Torah that helps us to better understand everything else that exists in the world. The Sforno states that the three lamps on the left side symbolize the businessman. The three lamps on the right side symbolize the Torah scholar. And the center lamp alludes to God Almighty himself. All of them were fashioned from one block of gold. So this is an illusion that all Jews, all Jews must be united as one in their service of God, our Father in heaven. There were six branches that were connected to the shaft of the menorah three on each side. The Asnaim Latora says the menorah was made up of seven branches. The center shaft alludes to the Shabbat and the other six branches to the six days of the week. As we learn in the Talmud and the tractate of Psachim, that Sunday through Tuesday correspond to the previous week and Monday through Friday to the next week. The menorah is also an allusion to both the written and the oral Torah. Verse 32 begins with the words, Vashisha Konim, and six branches. Now, the number six alludes to the six orders of the Mishnah, what we call the Oral Torah, the Gematria. The numerical value of the Hebrew word Vashisha and six is 611. This is the exact same Gematria, numerical value of the Hebrew word Torah, alluded to, alluding to, again, the written Torah. Rabbi Marai Ashkenazi stated that the outer lights represent the sciences and the center light, the Torah. This may be allusion to the fact that if one studies the sciences properly, they will all shed their light on the Torah. This is one of the reasons that the six lights were all facing towards the center light. We read that when Shlomo Melk built the first temple, he fashioned the windows of the Hechel wide at the outside and narrow at the inside. Now, normally, when one constructs the windows of their home, they would make them narrow at the outside and wide at the inside. This would allow more sunlight to enter into the house. However, the person, purpose pardon me, of the menorah in the temple was not to light the Hechel, God's house. God has no need of light. His purpose was to illuminate this physical world with a godly spiritual light. The Rashbam said the menorah cast his light onto the shulchan, the table. The question we must ask is, why would the shulchan need a light? 
The menorah alludes to Torah and its wisdom, whereas the Shulchan alludes to this physical world. God created many things in this physical world that a Jew cannot eat or use. So the menorah symbolized by the Torah scholar must illuminate this physical world and teach a Jew that which is permitted and that which is forbidden for them to partake of. The Pedinim of the Torah states that the altar's function was to allow a person to receive forgiveness once they had sinned. They would do so by bringing a sin, a chatos or a guilt offering, an asham. The menorah's function was to illuminate the world with kedusha, with holiness, so that they wouldn't sin at all. Today, the function of the altar has been replaced by our daily prayers. In our daily prayers, we beseech God Almighty, our Father in Heaven, to forgive our transgressions and to help us to overcome our evil inclination, our Yitzhahar. The function of the menorah has been replaced by the Torah scholar, whose mission it is today to teach and show us the way towards a life of Torah and mitzvot. The Rebbe, Rebbe Menachem Ben Lushnirson of Blessed Memory, stated that the seven branches of the menorah allude to the seven emotional traits that God Almighty has taken upon himself. They allude to the seven types of Jewish souls. Aaron's job in lighting the menorah was to reveal the spiritual reality which existed within each and every member of the children of Israel. This is also why the Torah introduces the portion about the menorah with the Hebrew words, Bahalosacha, raise up, and not the word madlik, to light or kindle. This is an allusion to what Rashi states, that the coin must kindle the light, meaning until the flame goes up by itself. So too with each member of the children of Israel. It is the job of the coin to light the godly flame that resides within the soul of each and every Jew. Then once the flame is burning, his mission is to instruct them on how to keep the flame burning on its own, even without his assistance. Rashi, commenting on the opening verse in the portion of Baal Osecha, states that there was a step that was placed in front of the menorah. The step function is a sort of footstool, so that the coin would stand on it to clean the lights. It's interesting, our stages tell us that anyone, even a non-Kohen, may light the menorah, but that only a Kohen was permitted to clean it. So from this law we learn an important fact about Judaism, that Heksher Mitzvah, that the preparation for a mitzvah can even be greater than performing the mitzvah itself. The Shach states that the order of the vessels in the Mishnah should have been first the Ark, then the Menorah, and then the Shulchan. The Menorah should have followed the Ark since the Menorah, the candelabra, symbolizes Torah. Or B'tzal made the Ark first and then the Shulchan, the table. Then last he made the Menorah. If you take the three together, they form, the first letter forms an acronym for the word Asham, meaning guilt offering. Since the world was tainted by the sin of Adam, first man, and one of the functions of the Mishkan was to correct that sin. The Mishkan alludes to three worlds. The world of the angels, heaven, and earth. The Holy of Holies corresponds to the world of angels. And with the Ark and the Kruven, heaven is alluded to by the holies with the menorah, which consisted of seven branches. This corresponds to the seven heavens in addition to the seven planets. Then the Shulchan, the table with the twelve showbreads, which alluded to the twelve signs of the zodiac. It contained, it continues, pardon me, with the, the golden altar, which is connected to the smoke of the incense, the Ketorit, rising up to heaven. Earth is alluded to by the courtyard and the sacrificial altar of copper. This was the altar where the animals were sacrificed and their blood was offered up to God Almighty. This corresponds to this world, a world of life and death. You know, man is referred to as an olam cotton, a small world. He too is divided into three parts, which correspond to the Mishkan. The head alludes to the world of angels with the brain which houses the Shekhinah, the divinity of God. Again, this corresponds to the Holy of Holies and the Ark. In addition, it corresponds to four of our five senses, hearing, smelling, seeing, and speaking. 
which are all connected to spirituality and the angels. The heart corresponds to the heavenly spheres that sustain the body much like the neshama, the soul, which resides in the heart and is the seat of all of man's emotions. The diaphragm alludes to the parochet, the curtain that separated between the holy and the holy of holies. The diaphragm created a separation between the upper and lower parts of a person's body. This corresponds to the earth and the lower earthly desires of man. So the Mishkan was really a microcosm of both man and the terrestrial and celestial world, worlds that we inhabit. As I mentioned earlier, there were 22 cups on the menorah. So on each branch, pardon me, three on each branch and four that were on the shaft itself. The shaft alludes to the Torah scholar. The Hassam Sofer states that these four cups allude homiletically to the Torah scholar who is immersed in four areas of Torah study. They are Chumash, Mishnah, Talmud, and Kabbalah. They were molded into the shape of almond blossoms. And the Hebrew word for shekeda, meaning almond, is also used in Talmudic terminology as immersed, that a Torah scholar should be totally immersed in their studies. Now, four may also be seen as an illusion, that the light of the menorah lit up the world in all four directions. Now, the lighting of the menorah is the only ritual whose performance was stated in the Torah in the opening portion of Tetzabe with the words, Chukat Olam Lodoro Sam, an everlasting ritual for all generations. Now, how can the Torah state for all generations? After all, we have not had a temple for almost 2,000 years. These words was meant, were meant as an allusion to both the Ner Tumid, the perpetual light that we still light continuously in our synagogues, and also the lighting of the Hanukkah menorah. The menorah corresponds to the seven days of creation, the seven openings of the head, two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, and one mouth, the seven books of the Torah, with the fourth book of Numbers, of the book of Devar, uh, pardon me, Midbar, is broken up into three parts. But mostly it alludes to the seven lamps of the menorah that escort us into the Shabbat, the holiest day of the week, the day that introduces a spiritual light into the secular world us from week to week. You know, I hope you found your tour informative and inspirational. Next week, I would like to hopefully conclude our tour of the Mishkan and its vessels and look at the courtyard that surrounded it. I would like to offer a prayer for an end to the war in Gaza with the safe release of all the hostages. May God Almighty cure all the injured, console all the mourners, and protect all the brave IDF soldiers and those civilians who are currently in harm's way. Again, with the coming of Mashiach Sukainu quickly and in our time, may it be now. Again, let me thank you for attending. Again, God should bless you and yours with only good. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay safe. Again, please subscribe, if you will, and push like, and please share with your friends. Again, hopefully there are things here that will help people to live their lives and through these difficult times that we're living. And with that, hopefully, bring in the coming of Mashiach Sukainu now. Again, please stand by. There will be a uh, musical rendition right after this, and I uh, hope you enjoyed that too. God bless. Be well. Shabbat Shalom.